Today uh, I am presenting my annual report for 2022 uh, and uh, this report sums up uh, the main activity activities of our alliance uh, uh, in the, the last uh, year. Uh, 2022 uh, was a pivotal year for our security. Russia's illegal war against Ukraine is now entering its uh, second year. Uh, President Putin uh, made a big strategic mistake uh, when he invaded uh, Ukraine. He expected uh, Kiev would fall within days and the whole of Ukraine within weeks. But he underestimated the steely resistance of the Ukrainian uh, people. He thought uh, he could break NATO unity, but NATO allies are standing strong and united and providing unprecedented support for Ukraine. And he wanted less NATO, but he has got exactly the opposite, more NATO. In response to Russia's illegal war, Finland and Sweden decided to apply for NATO membership, which will double the length of NATO's border with Russia. At the NATO summit in Madrid last June, all allies took the historic decision to invite Finland and Sweden to join. Both countries have addressed Turkey's legitimate uh, security concerns and delivered uh, on their commitments under the trilateral memorandum agreed in Madrid. Turkey is uh, now ready to ratify Finland's membership of NATO. I welcome that decision. And I look forward to the Grand National Assembly ratifying Finland's accession before the upcoming Turkish general election. I also welcome that the Hungarian parliament will vote on Finland next uh, week. The most important thing is that both uh, Finland and Sweden become full members of NATO quickly, not whether they join at exactly the same time. And I will continue to work hard to ensure that Sweden becomes a full member as soon as possible. Because the accession of Finland and Sweden will make them safer, our alliance stronger and demonstrate that NATO's door remains open. President Putin wants a different Europe. He sees democracy and freedom as a threat and he seeks to control its neighbours. So even if the war in Ukraine ended tomorrow, the security environment has changed for the long term. Putin's uh, invasion last year was a shock, but it was not a surprise. It was the culmination of a pattern of aggressive action. And in response, since Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, NATO has implemented the largest reinforcement of collective defense in a generation. So when Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine, we were ready. Within hours, we activated our defense plans from the Baltic to the Black Sea. We put 40,000 troops under NATO command with a significant air and maritime presence and doubled the number of NATO battle groups uh, from four to eight. At the same time, NATO allies have provided Ukraine with significant support, supplying advanced uh, weapon systems and ammunition to help Ukraine defend itself and regain territory. We are also in the process of agreeing uh, new capability targets for the production of battle decisive ammunition and engaging with industry to ramp up production to support Ukraine against Russia's aggression and for our own defence. NATO is increasing the protection of critical national uh, infrastructure, including undersea cables and pipelines. We have set up uh, an undersea infrastructure coordination cell here at NATO headquarters and established a joint NATO-EU task force. At our summit uh, in Madrid last June, NATO allies agreed a further fundamental shift in our deterrence and defence, with new plans assigning specific forces to, to defend specific allies. High readiness, more stocks and more pre-positioned equipment, and even stronger command and control arrangements. 
We agreed uh, a new strategic concept, the first in a decade, to guide our lines in an era of strategic competition. It identifies Russia as the most significant threat to our security, along with the ongoing threat of terrorism, and makes clear that China challenged uh, our interests, security and values. 2022 was the eighth consecutive year of increased defence spending across Europe and Canada. Last year, defence spending increased by 2.2% in real terms. Since Allies agreed the defence investment pledge in 2014, European Allies and Canada have spent an additional 350 billion extra on defence. Many Allies have also announced significant defence spending increases since Russia's invasion. Now these pledges must turn into real cash, contracts and concrete equipment. Because defence spending underpins everything we do. Since 2014, Allies have increased defence spending and we are moving in the right direction. But we are not moving as fast as the dangerous world we live in demands. So while I welcome all the progress that has been made, it is obvious that we need to do more and we need to do it faster. At our summit in Vilnius in July, I expect Allies to agree a more ambitious new defence investment pledge, with 2% of GDP as a minimum to be invested in our defence. In this new and more contested world, we cannot take our security for granted. It is our security that underpins our prosperity and our way of life. Our latest uh, polling shows that 82% of people across the 30 NATO allies believe it is important that North America and Europe uh, work together for our shared security. And 61% agree that NATO membership makes an attack from a foreign nation less likely. NATO has enabled Europe and North America to live in peace for almost 75 years. But today's world is as dangerous as at any time since the Second World War. The years to come will be challenging and NATO must continue to rise to the challenge. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. Okay, we'll start with Reuters, yeah. From Reuters. Uh, Secretary General, can you tell us how many uh, countries are currently meeting the 2% target according to your latest report? Um, and if that number is still relatively small as a part of the total, um, can you uh, comment on do you have any concerns about the fact that even um, almost 10 years after that uh, goal was agreed, uh, most allies aren't make, meeting that target? We have all the numbers and the figures uh, updated in this uh, report, uh, both uh, graphically but also uh, in tables uh, where you can look into the details for each and every uh, ally. Um, and it shows that uh, seven allies now spend uh, 2%. Uh, uh, we actually expected that to be slightly more uh, earlier, uh, but because GDP has increased more than expected for a couple of allies, uh, two allies that we expected to be at 2% are now slightly below 2%. Um, um, so, as I said, uh, we welcome the progress, we welcome the fact that all allies have increased, that more allies uh, now spend 2% uh, uh, of uh, GDP on uh, defence, and more and more allies are actually coming closer to uh, 2%. Having said that, there's no doubt that we need to do more and we need to do it faster. The pace we have uh, when it comes to increased defence spending is not uh, high enough. Um, so uh, my message to allies is that I welcome what they have done, but they need to speed up, they need to deliver more. In a more dangerous world, we need to invest more uh, in uh, defence. Then let me add that, of course, it is important that um, allies meet the 2% guideline, but of course it also helps that those allies who have been close to 1% now are at 1.5, we're moving towards 2%. So, for instance, Germany uh, has significantly increased defence spending over the last years. They're still not at 2%, uh, 
uh, but the uh, increase in German defense spending really makes a big difference because of the sheer volume of the uh, German economy and the German defense budget, and Germany has clearly committed to uh, be at 2% uh, soon. Okay, we'll go to Associated Press. Uh, Secretary General Lorne Cook from the Associated Press, you, um, you just met with the Hungarian Foreign Minister, uh, and I understand from some remarks that he's made in, in Brussels that you intend to go ahead with a, uh, a ministerial level um, meeting at some point, uh, NATO-Ukraine, uh, and I wondered why you've made that decision to go ahead uh, despite what I understand to be existing Hungarian objections. Uh, and if I could briefly, I'd be very interested in any remarks you might have about the uh, Chinese peace plan uh, that uh, President Xi and, uh, and President Putin are talking about at the moment. Thank you. First, on uh, the peace plan, um, uh, it is for Ukraine uh, to decide uh, what are acceptable uh, conditions uh, for any peaceful uh, solution. Uh, and uh, uh, China, therefore, needs to uh, start uh, to understand Ukraine's perspective uh, and to engage uh, with President uh, Zelensky uh, directly if, uh, it's, uh, serious, uh, if it wants to be serious about uh, peace. Uh, we also need to remember that uh, China has not been able to condemn uh, the illegal war aggression by Russia against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, having said that, of course, I will welcome any initiative, any plan uh, that can lead to a just and uh, sustainable uh, peace. Um, China's peace proposal includes some positive uh, aspects and elements uh, which I uh, support. Uh, for instance, the uh, importance of nuclear uh, safety, of uh, protection of uh, civilians, and not least uh, uh, underline the importance of uh, sovereignty, uh, territorial integrity and independence. Uh, and, of course, any peace uh, solution for Ukraine must be based on these principles to the respect of the territorial integrity uh, and sovereignty of, uh, of Ukraine. And this is also the main element of uh, the peace plan that uh, President Zelensky put forward uh, some uh, months ago. Uh, and, of course, any uh, durable and uh, lasting peace has to respect Ukraine as a sovereign, independent nation in Europe. Uh, uh, in accordance with uh, the UN uh, Charter. Um, and a ceasefire or any solution that doesn't uh, respect the sovereignty and territorial integrity of uh, Ukraine um, uh, will only be a way to freeze the war and uh, to ensure that uh, Russia can uh, reconstitute, uh, regroup and re-attack. And that will not be a just and sustainable uh, peace. It will only help Russia to hold on to territory it has illegally uh, occupied. So again, I welcome initiatives that can lead to a just and sustainable peace. At the end of the day, it has to be uh, up to Ukraine to decide what are the acceptable conditions. What we should do is to support Ukraine in their right to defend themselves, a right which is enshrined in the UN Charter, and they are defending themselves against uh, Russia's uh, illegal war of, uh, of aggression. Uh, then uh, on, um, on the uh, NATO-Ukraine uh, uh, Commission, uh, yes, my plan is to convene uh, a meeting uh, um, at our foreign ministerial uh, meeting uh, in a couple of uh, weeks. Uh, I do so because I think this is a platform to uh, demonstrate our uh, uh, support to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine is an enhanced opportunity partner. Um, but at the same time, I'm aware of the issues related to uh, minorities, and this is an issue that has also been discussed directly with uh, Ukraine in previous meetings, and I guess that will continue to be, I expect that to continue to be part of a dialogue with uh, Ukraine. Politica. Thank you very much. Secretary General, you mentioned that you will be advocating for a more ambitious defense investment pledge. I was wondering if you could share perhaps a bit of detail of what you would be advocating for at Vilnius. Would it be again a 10-year pledge? Uh, will the number still be 2 percent just as a floor or would you be advocating for a different number? Thank you. So first of all, it, it has to be, uh, or it will be up to uh, 30 allies, or soon to be 32 allies, to decide what will be uh, the, uh, uh, the language of uh, a new uh, uh, defense investment uh, pledge. 
but I will work for and I will advocate in favour of a more ambitious uh, pledge uh, than the pledge we made uh, in 2014, uh, simply because, yes, the war started in 2014 with the illegal annexation of Crimea and Russia going into Eastern Donbass, but of course the full-fledged invasion that we saw uh, last February has made it difficult and dangerous and and, and, and challenge the security uh, situation even more dangerous and even more challenging. So if there was a need to increase defence spending back in 2014, it is uh, even more obvious now. And, um, and, and of course, we also have to build on the progress we have made. Back in 2014, uh, 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 the majority of NATO allies were reducing their uh, defence budgets. Uh, total defence spending across Europe and Canada was going down year by year. So we are on a downward trend. Uh, and only three allies uh, spent 2% or more uh, on, on defence. Since 2014, that picture has totally changed. Now, all allies have uh, uh, increased defence spending, um, and, uh, and, uh, and in totality, uh, we now have eight consecutive years of uh, uh, more defence spending across Europe and Canada. So, uh, we are in a totally different place. Uh, than where we were in 2014 when things were going down, now they're going up and, and, and they're going significantly up defence spending. So of course when you then agree a new defence investment pledge at the uh, summit in Vilnius, it has to build on the progress we've already made and take into account the fact that we live in a more dangerous uh, world. Um, so what I will argue in favour is that uh, when we refer to 2% in the pledge we made, we made in Wales at the NATO summit in Wales in 2014, we refer to that as something we should strive towards, more like a, a, a kind of a, a ceiling. Uh, uh, but now we should refer to 2% more as a floor, a minimum. Uh, and of course then we had a kind of 10-year perspective, um, uh, 2014 to 2024. Now I think we should be uh, all understand that this is going to immediate need uh, to be there, and we have had now 10 years already to move towards 2%. So I expect uh, actually the reality that uh, the majority of allies could be able to be at 2% very quickly. Agence France Presse, here. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Secretary General. Um, just returning to uh, the issue of China, um, have you had, do you have any more information on whether China is planning or is actually supplying arms to Russia for the war in Ukraine? And more specifically, what is your message to President Xi as he meets with a leader who is now accused of committing war crimes? Thank you. As a first, uh, we haven't seen any proof that uh, China is uh, delivering little uh, weapons to Russia. Uh, but we have uh, seen uh, some signs that uh, this has been a request uh, from Russia and that this is an issue that uh, is, cons is, is uh, considered uh, 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 in Beijing or by the Chinese authorities. And therefore our message has been that China should not provide lethal aid to, uh, to, uh, to Russia. Uh, that will be uh, to support uh, an illegal war uh, and only prolong the war and support uh, the a legal invasion uh, of, uh, of Ukraine by, by Russia. That's something that China, of course, not should do. Um, um, then, uh, of course, the meeting um, that takes place in Moscow is part of a pattern we have seen uh, over the last years, where China and Russia are coming closer and closer. Uh, we have to remember that just uh, a couple of weeks, or a few weeks before the invasion last February, President Xi and President Putin met in Beijing, uh, where they signed a joint declaration promising each other uh, a partnership without any limits. Um, and, uh, and we see how China and Russia are uh, coming closer and closer in the military domain. They have uh, joint exercises, joint patrols, naval and air patrols uh, in the economic domain and also in the political and diplomatic uh, domain. So the meeting in Moscow is part of that pattern where China and Russia are working more and more uh, closely and building a stronger and stronger uh, partnership. Uh, Slovenian TV over there, yeah. Uh, Igor Juric, uh, Slovenia, over there. Slovenian Television uh, Secretary uh, General, just a short uh, question. Uh, how do you see and, of course, also comment uh, the latest development in the relations between uh, Serbia and uh, Kosovo, especially after this uh, awkward uh, meeting of uh, both leaders? 
Well, uh, also I welcome the agreement, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, important thing now is uh, the full implementation, the speed and full Im implementation of the agreement between uh, Belgrade and, uh, and Pristina. Um, and of course, we strongly support uh, the EU-facilitated dialogue. Uh, we uh, need to analyze and need to provide the political support. We have been in close contact uh, uh, with uh, uh, the EU, but also with uh, Pristina and Belgrade. Uh, and of course, we support also uh, uh, the efforts uh, to find a peaceful uh, solution uh, through our K4 mission, uh, uh, close to 4,000 NATO troops uh, in, uh, in Kosovo, uh, which are key to, uh, to, uh, to facilitate and, and, uh, and support a political uh, process. Um, so we welcome the agreement. Uh, the message is that it has to be fully and, uh, and, and quickly uh, implemented by both parties. Frankfurt Allgemeine. Dr. Thomas Guschka, Frankfurt Allgemeine Zeitung. Uh, two questions. The first is for clarification. Um, has Hungary formally agreed to another meeting of the NATO-Ukraine Commission? And the second one is on ammunition. Yesterday, EU foreign and defense ministers took the decision to provide Ukraine with one million artillery shells within 12 months. Um, uh, Commissioner Breton is also um, working with industry uh, to get around bottlenecks in the production, hoping to speed it up. I'm just wondering, what specifically is NATO's role in speeding up delivery and production of artillery shells? What specifically can NATO do? Thank you. Uh, uh, first, on the, on, the, on, the, on the speeding up uh, delivery. As we, NATO has many tasks. So first of all, uh, it's for us to set the guidelines, and uh, we started uh, last year to revise our guidelines, and not least for battle decisive ammunition, which includes artillery shells, uh, to ensure that uh, Allies started uh, uh, to ramp up production, both to replenish uh, the stockpiles, which they have depleted to provide support to Ukraine, but of course also to be able to continue to, uh, to uh, deliver uh, support to, uh, to Ukraine. Uh, we met with the defense industry, we met with our armored uh, directors, uh, and, uh, and the message was very clear, a ramp up our production, and I welcome that all of these several allies have signed contracts. Uh, of course, that is a, a national uh, decision to sign the concrete contracts with the industry. Uh, but we also do uh, have done for many years, including on ammunition, uh, we, have, uh, we are doing joint procurement, uh, uh, partly uh, with groups of NATO allies, uh, but also through the uh, NATO Support and Procurement Agency. So joint procurement is something we have done for many years. We will continue to do joint procurement, uh, including of ammunition. Um, for instance, the NSPA now is working on both, uh, or have projects both on uh, artillery, uh, uh, but also uh, uh, air defense uh, 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 ammunition and other types of ammunition. So I welcome, of course, the fact that uh, EU is now also engaging in joint procurement. Uh, but the most important thing is not whether the joint procurement is a group of nations or EU or the NATO uh, procurement agency uh, or whether it's done by individual allies. The most important thing is that contracts are signed uh, with the industry so production can be increased. And we have already seen uh, more uh, contracts being signed and we welcome all the different initiatives in different formats uh, for joint procurement uh, because we think that can uh, help to speed up and also uh, utilize the economy of, uh, of scale. Uh, but again, it happens in different formats, including uh, 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 through the uh, NATO Support and Procurement uh, uh, Agency. Um, um, so far, NATO allies have, have uh, delivered uh, uh, military support of uh, 65 billion uh, 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 euros. Uh, 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 a lot of that comes from the United States, but also Canada and European allies are providing significant military support to, to, uh, to, to Ukraine. Uh, and this is not least uh, 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 to finance uh, the delivery of, uh, of uh, ammunition. Um, um, yeah, then, sorry? Yeah, they, yeah, so, well, it, it's my prerogative to uh, convene the, uh, the NATO-Ukraine uh, Council. Uh, um, uh, uh, no, yeah, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and I do that because I think the time has come. Uh, um, of course, I always try to have uh, allies to uh, agree, but uh, when we cannot fully agree, then it's still my prerogative to 
uh, convened a meetings of the North Atlantic Council in different formats, and, and now I do that. Uh, Swedish Radio. Here. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Secretary General. What does it mean in concrete terms that uh, Swedish NATO membership is a top priority, as you said yesterday? Uh, and the second question, how included is Sweden for the NATO future plans for the Baltic Sea? Uh, do Finland is approaching NATO membership faster than Sweden? I didn't get the last question. Uh, how does it mean in concrete terms for the NATO plans for Baltic Sea that uh, Finland is approaching NATO membership faster than Sweden? So first of all, uh, I, I, I'm absolutely confident that uh, also Sweden will become a full member of this alliance. Uh, second, it is a top priority for me, uh, meaning that I really believe that it will be good for uh, NATO, it will be good for Finland, it will be good for Sweden, it will be good for all of us uh, to have Finland and Sweden in as quickly as possible. That's also the reason why I worked hard to get the agreement uh, 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 last year, which was an historic uh, decision that all NATO allies, also Turkey and Hungary made, to invite Finland and Sweden. And since then, since, uh, since uh, uh, June last year, we have had the quickest accession process in NATO's modern history. Because we have to remember that Finland and Sweden applied in May, only in June they were invited, and since then uh, uh, Finland and Sweden has had a, a, a totally new position in NATO, because they ha now have the position as invitees, meaning that they sit at the NATO table, uh, we integrate in, uh, Finland and Sweden more and more into NATO's civilian and military structures, and this integration process will take some time, with military planning, with capability targets, and, and that integration process has not been postponed uh, by uh, uh, the fact that the ratification has taken a bit more time than we hoped. So, so the military in in integration goes on, regardless of, in a way, uh, 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 the, uh, the fact that uh, Hungary and, uh, and, and, uh, and Turkey has not ratified, because part of being invitee means that you can be in, in integrated into NATO's military structures, including uh, interim uh, capability targets. So the military planning, the integration process, uh, is something which is moving on, uh, uh, not delayed by uh, 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 the ratification uh, process. Um, um, uh, second uh, is that, uh, for me, this is a top priority, meaning that I spent, uh, so I did what I could together with with, Prem, with, with President Saulin Inisto, with uh, at that time uh, uh, Prime Minister Madalena Andersson, uh, and, and, and with the new government in Sweden, we have continued to work together closer to ensure uh, the agreement, uh, the invitation, and now the uh, integration into NATO's civilian and military structures, and then uh, the ratification. So far, 28 has ratified. I went to Ankara, uh, I think it's now. Uh, uh, three or four weeks ago, uh, we had a good meeting with uh, President Erdogan. That was the meeting where he made it clear that he is ready to, uh, or Turkey is ready to ratify um, Finland. Uh, um, and I welcome that, uh, that we now see uh, 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 progress on the ratification of Finland, and hopefully that will happen very soon. Um, then on Sweden, uh, President Erdogan in the meeting agreed uh, to restart the process. Uh, and also in the meetings of uh, what we call the permanent mechanism, uh, where Finland, Sweden, uh, Turkey um, uh, meet, and they met uh, under my auspices here at the NATO headquarters a few days ago. Uh, and that also then led to the formal announcement of the uh, 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 decision to move on with the ratification of Finland. Uh, but of course, in uh, that meeting, we also then are able to address how to make progress uh, on the ratification of Sweden and we will continue to meet. I spoke again with, uh, with uh, President Erdogan on Friday, uh, and we uh, again agreed uh, to continue the consultations and, uh, and the meetings uh, to ensure that we can also make uh, progress on the ratification of, uh, of uh, Sweden. Then I spoke this morning with, uh, President, uh, no, sorry, with, uh, with uh, the Foreign Minister of, uh, of Hungary, uh, um, Petri Sjarto, and, uh, and, and he also confirmed that uh, there will be a vote uh, on the 27th of um, March uh, on, uh, in, the, in the Hungarian Parliament on the ratification of Finland, and we will continue then to work on progress, making progress on the ratification of, uh, of uh, Sweden. Interfax Ukraine, stadium with the red scarf. We have a microphone there. Oh. 
Thank you, Anna. Uh, news agency, Ukrainian news agency, Interfax Ukraine, Irina Sumer. Follow up on NATO Ukraine Commission. Secretary General, is it mean that we can see from now on that such kind of meeting will take place regularly? on a regular basis, and even that participation of the president, Ukrainian president, Mr. Zelensky, in Vilnius, also will take place in this format, NATO Ukraine Commission. And second question is, don't you think that time came to denounce NATO-Russia Rome agreement, which established also NATO-Russia Council? Thank you. NATO allies worked for a meaningful dialogue with uh, Russia for many, many years. Russia has walked away from that dialogue, so that's not uh, functioning. It, 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 it is not possible to have a meaningful dialogue with Russia uh, when they are conducting a legal war of aggression against uh, uh, Ukraine. Uh, but we used the NATO-Russia Council uh, 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 up till the invasion. Uh, we have to remember that we actually met in this building uh, 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 in January, uh, just a few weeks before the invasion, to try to uh, convince and to try to use all uh, diplomatic and political channels to prevent uh, uh, President Putin, Russia, for, from uh, uh, implementing to, to follow through on their plans to invade uh, Ukraine. So, so the, the NATO-Russia Council was an important instrument uh, in our efforts to try to establish some kind of meaningful dialogue with uh, Russia. We used it to try to prevent the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine, but since the invasion, uh, uh, this has no meaning. Uh, uh, we cannot have any meaningful dialogue with a country that is uh, uh, responsible for an uh, illegal war of aggression uh, against the neighbour uh, Ukraine. Um, so, so we don't have meetings, of course, in this council now. Then when it comes to the NATO-Ukraine um, uh, council, uh, we, uh, uh, this, is, this is an established framework. I have the mandate to convene it. Uh, I have, in respect for the, the issues that... Uh, uh, Hungary has raised. I have uh, not convened that for some time, uh, but now I will continue to convene the, the, the meetings of the, of the NATO-Ukraine uh, uh, Council, uh, the Commission, sorry, uh, and, uh, and I will uh, start with the meeting at the foreign ministerial meeting. I have not planned any more meetings, but of course this will not be a, a one-off one event. We will continue to have meetings. Uh, when it comes to the um, the summit, we have not decided uh, finally on the formats, but I have made it clear that uh, I will invite uh, President uh, Zelensky uh, to the summit. Uh, exactly in what format we will meet, that uh, has not yet been decided. Bloomberg. From Bloomberg. I just want to follow up on the, the question about Sweden's ratification. Do you still expect Sweden to be ratified by both Turkey and Hungary um, by Vilnius? And then secondly, on um, the question about uh, MiG fighter jets, Poland and Slovakia pledged, what impact do you expect this to have on the battlefield? And have any allies expressed concern about these deliveries, um, especially with regards to escalation? Thank you. Well, on, on Finland, uh, based on what has been announced both from uh, uh, Hungary and Turkey, the two allies that have not yet ratified the Finnish accession protocol, uh, I, I expect that uh, uh, they can become members uh, before the, um, the Turkish election, uh, because uh, uh, because um, Finland, uh, sorry, Hungary has made it clear that they will vote uh, on this in the in the in the in the Hungarian Parliament on the 27th of March. Uh, so that's a base, what I say on what they have uh, publicly said and also told, uh, told, told me. Uh, and also, uh, um, Turkey uh, has made it clear that the plan is to uh, ratify uh, before the Turkish parliament uh, goes into recess ahead of the Turkish uh, election. Of course, I cannot guarantee on behalf of national parliaments that at the end of the day it's national parliaments that make the, the decisions. And I've been a parliamentarian and also prime minister myself, I'm always very careful not speaking on behalf of parliaments. Parliaments are sovereign bodies, they make their own decisions, but at least that's what has been announced. And I, based on those plans and those announcements, uh, Finland will be member very soon and before the uh, uh, Turkish uh, elections or before the Turkish parliament goes into recess based on what they have said. Um, then uh, uh, on Sweden, uh, I will not give you any exact dates. 
uh, but I'll just tell you that this is a top priority, uh, and I will work hard uh, to ensure that also uh, Sweden uh, becomes a full member uh, and that the ratification process can be finalized as soon as possible. That's the reason why I, I traveled to Ankara, that's the reason why I also spent uh, some time in, in Stockholm, uh, in Helsinki, and also convened the, the, uh, the um, trilateral uh, permanent mechanism uh, here at, at NATO, and will continue to engage with all these countries to ensure that we have the quickest possible ratification also of, uh, of, uh, of Sweden. Answer. Gentlemen, glasses. Yeah, thanks. Yes, sorry. Um, <clears throat> uh, Secretary General, in the Mediterranean, uh, migration is reaching a level unseen since the 2015 crisis. Uh, Italy has recent, recently linked this phenomenon with an in intentional rational destabilization strategy. And uh, as you know, the strategic concept states a 360 degrees approach to security and see the MED as a critical theater. Now, the question is, do you accept that the southern border can be at risk because of migration used as a hybrid weapon? And is uh, NATO ready uh, to do more in, uh, in that area? And secondly, if I may, um, would you be available for a second mandate? I mean, for a prolongation again of your mandate, maybe. Uh, <laughs> Uh, first, uh, on the south, um, well, NATO has a significant uh, presence in the Mediterranean uh, and in the south uh, to address instability, to fight the terrorism, and we also support efforts of the European Union to deal with the uh, illegal migration. We, for instance, have um, uh, uh, a naval presence uh, in the Aegean Sea uh, to help to implement the, um, the agreement between Turkey and uh, the European Union. Uh, on uh, illegal migration. I've been there since, uh, for, for several uh, years. We're also working with partners um, like uh, uh, Mauritania, uh, uh, like uh, Tunisia and others to help them build their defense and security institutions to stabilize their own countries. Uh, that's to address the root causes of the uh, uh, migration challenge. Uh, so we are working in many different ways. Uh, and of course, we also see that uh, we see uh, increased Russian presence in, what we, in, in the south or in Africa, uh, not least with the Wagner Group. Uh, so uh, I think that it just highlights that NATO doesn't have the luxury of choosing either uh, uh, to either focus on one or the other uh, challenge or threat uh, we face. We need to be able to deal with all of them at the same time. Of course, they are in different nature and, and different intensity, but NATO has to deal with them at the same time. Uh, also, a lot of what we do on critical infrastructure is also related to the south. There are cables, there are undersea infrastructure also in the Mediterranean. Uh, but, of course, uh, NATO is a, a military alliance. We have our tools, then the European Union, national uh, nations have uh, all the tools. Uh, so we don't, we don't have all the tools to address all the issues related to migration, but we support the efforts of, uh, of the European Union and, uh, and individual allies in different uh, ways, and we'll continue to do so, and also step up our uh, work with partners, for instance, uh, or in Africa, uh, and also in Iraq. I met with the Iraqi, Iraqi foreign minister uh, yesterday, uh, and uh, we have a presence there of a training mission to help Iraq to stabilize their own country, and that's also a way to address the root causes of the of the uh, uh, illegal migration. Uh, in Medin, Georgia. Uh, thank you very much. Mr. Secretary General, two questions uh, about Georgia. Uh, first, um, uh, as we are waiting for Vilnius summit uh, uh, this um, summer, and for more support uh, from uh, NATO, what can you tell us more about it and overall um, evaluation of 2022? Uh, and also, can you comment on recent developments in uh, Georgia? I mean, um, presentation in Georgian Parliament, uh, foreign agent draft, and in two days it was voted down. So, can you comment on this? Thank you very much. Also, I welcome the decision by the Georgian Parliament to vote down or to withdraw uh, the draft uh, law on foreign influence or foreign uh, agents, uh, because it's uh, incompatible with uh, Euro-Atlantic uh, values and the protection of fundamental uh, freedoms. So I welcome uh, that uh, uh, this proposal was withdrawn and then uh, not supported by the uh, uh, Parliament uh, in Tbilisi. 
Uh, I encourage uh, 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 Georgia's uh, political leaders uh, to work together on reforms urgently needed. Uh, and of course, NATO has also worked with uh, the government of Georgia to implement these reforms uh, uh, to strengthen democratic institutions, to strengthen democratic control over the um, security services, uh, and, and also uh, to fight uh, corruption. Uh, the Georgian uh, people have made it very clear that they want a democratic, prosperous uh, Georgia that is integrated into the Euro-Atlantic uh, region, and NATO will continue to be a partner to those aspirations. Okay, we'll go to Icelandic National TV. Your mom, Chris, from Icelandic National Television. Uh, you've talked a lot about Ukraine. Understandably, the focus of the alliance has been, has been there for the, in recent months. Are you keeping focus on Russia's activities in the high north? Um, and how will the membership, I mean, the eventual membership of Sweden and Finland change the dynamic on the northern flank of the alliance? So Finnish and Swedish membership will strengthen NATO in many different ways. Uh, first of all, it will strengthen the whole of NATO. Uh, and because Finland and Sweden has, uh, have uh, capable armed forces, well-trained, well-equipped, modern uh, uh, armed forces, uh, and, uh, and we have worked together with Finland and Sweden for many years. Uh, uh, they have naval, uh, land, and air forces which are highly capable and will help us also to increase our presence, our awareness, uh, also in the high north. And of course, both Finland and Sweden are Arctic nations. Uh, they know how to operate under Arctic conditions, uh, and it will also not least increase our ability to, uh, to utilize the airspace uh, in, the, in the high north. Uh, and, uh, and to operate across the borders uh, uh, in, uh, in the Nordic uh, region. Uh, so yes, that is important for uh, the high north, uh, for whole of NATO, but of course also, for instance, for the Baltic countries. If you just look at the map, you will see that reinforcement, uh, the protection of the Baltic region, uh, will be very different, and, uh, and, uh, and NATO will be in a much better place to do that with Finland and Sweden in. And therefore, I welcome the fact that all of us have invited them, that Finland will uh, very soon be ratified, based on what has been uh, announced from Ankara and from uh, Budapest, and then we will, I will continue to work hard for the uh, quickest possible ratification of uh, also uh, uh, Sweden. Uh, then the High North... Uh, uh, has mattered for uh, NATO for many years, uh, and therefore we have a significant presence there. We have several allies, uh, uh, which are Arctic nations, including uh, Iceland. Um, uh, we have presence uh, uh, in Iceland uh, with uh, uh, um, uh, NATO planes. Uh, um, Iceland uh, is important also when it comes to monitoring uh, uh, following the uh, Russian military movements up in the high north, their, their submarines, their ships, their, their, their planes. And allies are also now investing in new modern capabilities, including advanced uh, fifth generation uh, fighter aircraft well, that will significantly increase our uh, uh, capabilities when it comes to monitoring and surveillance uh, over uh, what's going on in the high uh, north. Um, more ships, uh, we have more exercises. And I just, last week, I went together with uh, uh, President Ursula von der Leyen and the Norwegian Prime Minister, Jonas Gahr Støre, to uh, one of the gas facilities, the gas platform, Troll uh, platform in the North Sea, which is important for Norway, for the Nordic region, but of course also for uh, energy supplies to Europe. 10% uh, of Europe's gas supplies uh, comes from that uh, one uh, platform. Uh, so, of course, when NATO also is stepping up what to do to protect critical infrastructure, that is also uh, very much about the high uh, north. Uh, so, uh, yes, high north is, has been and will continue to be of great importance for NATO. Uh, let me also add that climate change will make the high north even more important. The ice is melting. Uh, it's possible to operate there uh, uh, more uh, throughout the year, and, uh, and that will also increase the strategic importance of the high north. Thank you very much. I know there are more questions, but this is all we have time for now. However, uh, you can pick up a hard copy of the annual report on your way out uh, and uh, hope to see as many of you as possible uh, at the annual media reception. Thank you. Okay.